All right, Citizen YA, the artist formerly known as Wake. It's good to be together tonight. Are you guys happy to be in the house tonight? We're going to have a great time together. Um, like Maria was saying, we are in week two of a teaching series that we are calling A Trip Around the Sun. And really, that's just kind of a fancy way of talking about a new year, right? I don't know if you paid attention in you know, science class early on, but in one year's time, we take a trip around the sun on Earth, and we are really looking at setting up ourselves for success, stepping into this new season of life with purpose and confidence and chasing after God's call. And so I'm excited as we're in this new year, as we're still um, enjoying the newness and the freshness of 2020, that we're really diving into God's word and seeing what he has to share with us so that we can set ourselves up for the best future possible. And last week on Wednesday, Pastor Brandon kicked things off and really preached an incredible message. If you missed it, honestly, go to YouTube and check it out. If you didn't know, we have a YouTube channel. It's Citizen YA. Just search that, and all the messages that we share are posted there. So if you want to rewatch or share with a friend, you can do that. But last week, Pastor Brandon talked to us about the things we need to leave behind us as we enter into this new season. We need to leave behind old habits. We need to leave behind old hurts. And we need to leave behind old history. And we believe that in doing so, we can step into the purpose that God has for us and really enjoy the fullness of the future that he has created for us. So if you've got your Bibles tonight, go ahead and turn with me to Colossians. We're going to be starting there in chapter 1. And Brandon talked about this last week, but we really do want to encourage you to be bringing your Bibles every single week here to YA. We really have a heart to see a generation of young people who are obsessed with the Word of God, who are finding their footing in God's promises and God's revelation, and who are setting up their lives on the truth and the foundation of His Word. And so we believe that starts here in community, so we love to see pages flipping and seeing people taking notes, but if you don't have your Bible tonight, no worries, we'll have it up on the screen behind me. So I'm going to be reading Colossians 1, verses 26 and 27, and I'm going to be reading out of the Passion Translation. Here's what it says. There is a divine mystery. Everyone say mystery. A secret surprise that has been concealed from the world for generations, but now it's being revealed, unfolded, and manifested for every holy believer to experience. Living within you is the Christ who floods you with the expectation of glory. This mystery of Christ embedded within us becomes a heavenly treasure chest of hope filled with the riches of glory for his people and God wants everyone to know it. If you're taking notes tonight, the title of this message is Embracing the Mystery. Would you bow your heads with me tonight? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for all that you are. Thank you that you're so vast and so beyond our comprehension. It causes us to pause in this moment in awe and wonder and reverence of your majesty. As we're gathering in this atmosphere of worship, Lord, we know that your spirit is present. So Holy Spirit, right now we pause, we still our hearts, and we ask for you to come. Holy Spirit, I pray that you make yourself known in this place. Speak to every heart individually and specifically, Lord. You know every season, you know every situation, you know exactly what we need. So may my words not be my own, but may they, they be inspired by you, God. We love you, we praise you, and it's in the name of Jesus we pray. And everybody said amen, amen. Well, um, how many of you would raise a hand and say that you grew up in a household with some strict parents? Did anyone have strict parents? Great, I'm so glad I'm not the only one. Um, I had very strict parents growing up. My mom was very strict about our diet, for example. Um, we would never be able to eat sugary cereals. Like things like Lucky Charms and Frosted Flakes would never darken our doorway. We were the kind of family who had like um, sugar-free life cereal. Um, if my mom was really feeling crazy, she might buy frosted mini wheats, which really tasted like charred bales of hay. Um, but that was pretty much the extent of the sugar that was allowed into our breakfast routine each morning. When it came to snack time, she would buy reduced fat, low sodium Cheez It crackers, which tasted about as terrible as they sound. Um, and everything about our life, there's a lot of strict parameters that were put around it, even our entertainment. My parents did not pay for cable. We did not have TV growing up. We had the basic, like, five channels. 
And so we didn't get to watch TV. This was, I grew up in the dark ages before iPhones and, and laptops and iPads. And so I really had no access to any form of entertainment. And really the only thing that we were allowed to watch as, a, as me and my siblings, we were able to watch the Saturday morning cartoons. Is that still a thing? Because if it's a relic of the past, I'm sad for today's kids. Saturday morning cartoons were where it was at. But there was one show on Saturday mornings that me and my siblings were expressly forbidden from watching. And that was the Power Rangers. Because my mom said, their power doesn't come from Jesus. I'm not making this up for a sermon illustration. This is actually my upbringing. So while my friends um, would be discussing which color Power Ranger they wanted to be for Halloween, which incidentally we did not celebrate. No, no, we celebrated Hallelujah Day. And we went to our church. We got candy from church and uh, I was allowed to dress up as the mother of Jesus. I had my baby doll, I had my headscarf. And my brother had a lion costume, but he couldn't just be a lion. That wasn't biblical enough. So my mom called him the Lion of Judah. And so this was, this was kind of the way we were brought up. We didn't get to watch TV. We didn't get sugary cereal, but I think we turned out okay. But that being said, we didn't really have much forms of entertainment. And so what me and my brothers and sisters did is we all turned into voracious readers. Does anyone love to read? Oh, I loved reading growing up. I would consume books like crazy. I have vivid memories. My mom would take me and my siblings to Cherry Hills Library, and she said, you can pick out as many books as how old you are. So if I was 10 years old, I could check out 10 books, and you better believe it, I did every single time. And I would just dive into books. I would get lost in the stories and the plot lines with the characters. And for me, my all-time favorite book series um, that I just read over and over and over again was the Nancy Drew Books. Has anyone read Nancy Drew? Okay, a few of you. These were written in the 30s, so they're kind of old-fashioned, but I just loved Nancy Drew. There's probably like 150 Nancy Drew novels out there, and I just found out today looking into it that they're all written by different people under one pseudonym, so that's kind of disappointing to me and really deflated a lot of my childhood um, expectations of the series, but I, I collected these books. This is just a few of them. Um, I pulled them out of my daughter's room. I thought one day I can give them to her and pass on my love of Nancy Drew, but I just loved these these books. There was something about them that just drew me in. She's this 16 year old, like super detective. But what I loved about it is all of the danger that she faced, it was always very manageable, right? It was just dangerous enough. Nothing too life threatening, nothing too scary, nothing that would keep you up at night. And all of the mysteries that she solved, she was able to tie them up with a pretty bow at the end of the book. And the bad guy always went to jail. And she always went home with her family and enjoyed a nice home-cooked meal. And it was kind of just the perfect scenario. It was like The Bachelor. You just know how it's going to end. Or do you? Anyone watching? Okay. Good. I'm not the only sinful person in the room. But it's funny because as kids, we love mystery. And in fact, mystery was just a big part of our lives growing up, right? I think it's because as children, there's so much that you don't know. There's so much that you have yet to understand. There's so much that you haven't quite figured out yet about life. But isn't it interesting that the older you get and the more advanced in life you become, we begin to learn to resist mystery. It kind of bugs us. And I'm not talking about mystery novels or mystery TV shows, but I'm talking about life's great mysteries. It begins to bug us a little bit. We don't like uncertainty. We like things that we can know, that we can understand. We live in an age where if you have a question about something, you don't have to just wonder about it. You just pull out your iPhone and you search it on Google and you figure that thing out right away. We don't like not knowing. It kind of bugs us. We have a deep need to know and a deep need to understand as a culture. And when we can't, we begin to resent that feeling. Aristotle said, all men by nature desire to know. This is a human reality. This is a shared experience. And we all desire knowledge. And it bugs us when we can't get it. I'll give you some examples. You know, there are some great mysteries in life that when you think about it a little bit too long and a little bit too hard, it starts to bug you a little bit, right? I mean, okay, for example, Kristen, will you stand up here on the front row? KB, she was just up here doing offering. She's wearing a red sweater. Everyone can see this, right? Go ahead, turn and wave, Miss America. A red sweater, okay. Have you ever wondered, do we all see the same colors, right? Like for me, I'm looking at this and we're all like, yes, red sweater, but maybe for you, you're looking and you're like, 
seeing red, but it's the color that I would identify as purple, but I would never know because I can't get in your mind. Does that start to bug anyone that we will never know if we all see the same colors? Maybe you've never thought that. Now you're not going to sleep tonight. You're welcome. Thank you, Kristen. You can sit down. Other great mysteries of life. What actually happens in Area 51? Oh, man, that thing bugs me so much. Anyone ready to storm Area 51? Is that still happening? Let me know. I'm going. I am dying to know, what is the government hiding from us? What is so scary and so bad that they can't let us know? And it's been hidden behind closed doors for so long. Or another great mystery of life is, is the dress black and blue or is it white and gold? Do you think it's white and gold? Raise your hand. You're wrong. (laughs) But you're still welcome here. You know, I'm divergent because I can actually see both. I really, I can see both sides. So um, I understand you, but you're still wrong. You know, another one of life's great mysteries, we've been asking this question for decades. It's who let the dogs out? Who? I mean, will we ever know? It's still unanswered. But in all seriousness, we resist mystery. We don't like not knowing. We don't like uncertainty. And the feeling of unknowing bothers us, but if you've been a follower of Jesus Christ for any amount of time, you know that mystery kind of comes with the territory, right? As followers of Jesus, we have to learn to befriend mystery. We need to learn to embrace the unknown. And as we're talking tonight about this new trip around the sun that we're taking, this new year that we are stepping into, this new season that we're embarking on, inevitably we're going to find ourselves faced with the reality and the complexity of the unknown of the future. And there are things like Pastor Brandon talked about last week that we can proactively do to make a a good future for ourselves. We can get rid of old habits, we can let go of the past, but how many of you know that despite your best efforts and despite your best intentions, the future is still completely outside of your control? The future is out of your hands. And I think for so many of us that drives us a little bit crazy But I believe that the evidence of true spiritual maturity is being able to come to a point in your journey where you can say with full confidence, even if I never know, even if I never understand, even if I never get the answers to that question, I still believe that God is good, that he is for me, and that he is worth following. That's what embracing the mystery looks like. I love this quote from Gerald G. May. It says, when we were children... Most of us were good friends with mystery. The world was full of it, and we loved it. Then as we grew older, we slowly accepted the indoctrination that mystery exists only to be solved. For many of us, mystery became an adversary. Unknowing became a weakness. The contemplative spiritual life is an ongoing reversal of this adjustment. It is a slow and sometimes painful process of becoming as little children again in which we first make friends with the mystery and then finally fall in love again with it. As we continue in this teaching series, A Trip Around the Sun, and we learn and lean into this idea of embracing the mystery, I think there are three different areas that we need to learn to embrace. And the first is this. We need to embrace life's uncertainties. We need to understand that we can't know it all. We can't know the future We can't even sometimes comprehend or understand the present. And oftentimes, even when we look to our past, we don't understand why things happened the way that they are. And I think there are three truths when it comes to uncertainty. And the first is this, uncertainty is uncomfortable. Right, uncertainty is uncomfortable. And I know that I am preaching to the choir in this room, right? Because a room full of college students and and young adults, you know a thing or two about uncertainty. Some of you are still wrestling with what major you want to choose. Some of you are still wrestling, what career do I want to commit to for the rest of my life? Some of you are wrestling with the idea of who you want to marry, if you want to get married, when you want to have kids, if you want to have kids, where you want to live, who you want to become, what you want to stand for in your life. And for so many of us, we wrestle with uncertainty. And honestly, we kind of hate it, right? Uncertainty is uncomfortable. We prefer what's familiar. We like what's tested, what's proven, what's been done before. We like what we've seen, and we honestly like what we can control. 
We prefer familiarity, but can I tell you tonight that familiarity can be fatal? Because here's what happens. When you settle into a life of familiarity, you make your life there. You make your home there. You settle down. You lower your expectations. You stop taking risks, and you stop putting yourself in a position where you could experience failure. But you know, the life of God is a, the life following God is a life of risk. It's a life of stepping outside your comfort zone, of doing things that scare you a little bit. That is the requirement, the baseline requirement of a life of faith. Familiarity can be fatal. Uncertainty is uncomfortable. The second truth about uncertainty is that it is revealing. Uncertainty is revealing. The unknown will trigger different reactions in different people and almost always will expose your soul's defaults. Uncertainty can reveal in some people a level of fear. I think a lot of people, when they deal with uncertainty, they deal with fear. In some people, it can reveal anger. In some people, it can reveal a desire to control or manipulate the outcomes. You say, I don't know what's happening, so I'm going to do what I can to get it within my control, within my grasp. And for some people, uncertainty will reveal a level of apathy where you think life's too hard, it's too confusing, I can't figure it out, so I'm not going to do anything. Uncertainty can be revealing, but I think on the other hand, uncertainty can reveal some really great things in your heart and your spirit depending on your posture. Uncertainty can reveal a level of grit, right? A decision like, I don't know what's happening, and I don't know what the outcome's going to be, but I'm going to choose to dig my heels in. I'm going to choose to grit my teeth. I'm going to choose to demonstrate a little bit of resolve, and I'm going to choose to place my faith and my trust and my confidence in my God. Uncertainty can reveal good things in your life as well. I think the biggest thing that uncertainty reveals is your level of faith. So the question is, When you are faced with a situation that's outside of your control and outside of your understanding, how do you respond? I think the answer to that question establishes your posture when it comes to uncertainty. Either you are fearful about uncertainty or you are faithful about uncertainty. So uncertainty is uncomfortable. Uncertainty is revealing. And lastly, uncertainty is essential. Can I tell you that uncertainty is actually a very good thing, believe it or not, if we can learn to embrace uncertainty, it can be one of the most beautiful and remarkable things about your faith journey. I believe that uncertainty is the foundation of faith. Picture with me, if you will, a foundation of a building being laid, and across it, it just says the word uncertainty, and on it is built faith. I don't know what's happening, but I still trust in God. I don't know what my future looks like, but I know who my God is. I don't know why bad things happen, but I know that my God is good and faithful. Uncertainty is built on the foundation of faith, and you can't have faith until you have uncertainty. I mean, just look at the dictionary definition of faith. It can't get more basic than this. It says, faith is the strong belief in God or in the doctrines of a religion based on spiritual apprehension rather than proof. What you apprehend in the spiritual rather than what can be proven. Hebrews 11.1, the definition of faith found in scripture says, the fundamental fact of existence is that this trust in God, this faith is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. It's our handle on what we can't see. Faith and uncertainty go hand in hand. Do you remember when we were kids, when you would be playing on the playground and you'd have a friend who'd be like, hey, I bet you I can get on the swing set and I can swing so high that I can jump all the way across the grass field. And what did everyone say in response? They'd say, oh yeah, prove it. Or someone would say, oh, you know what? I can go down the slide backwards with my eyes closed. And someone would say, oh yeah, prove it. You know what I think is funny is in our adult life, I think that's how we look at God all the time. Say, oh yeah, prove it. Prove it to me. Prove me, prove to me that you're for me. Prove to me that you've got me. Prove to me. And we're asking God to prove it, but faith is actually embracing something that you may never be able to prove. But that's kind of the essence of it, isn't it? 
So rather than fighting against uncertainty, what if, as we embark on this trip around the sun, what if we choose to embrace uncertainty? What if we didn't allow uncertainty to direct us down the path of fear, but rather, what if we directed our uncertainty down the path of faith? What outcomes would that change in your life and in your perspective? I think if we can learn to embrace uncertainty rather than resist it, we're going to find ourselves on a wild God adventure that will, take, that will take us places we never could have dreamed. You know, it's just, you just have to open up scripture to see heroes of the faith, people that we are living in their legacy, and see the, the way that they base their faith on the reality of uncertainty. I mean, story after story after story. One of my favorites is the story of Abraham, and many of you know it, but in Hebrews 11, it chronicles the heroes of the faith, and it talks about Abraham's journey, using uncertainty as his foundation upon which he built his faith. This is what it says in Hebrews 11, verses 8 through 12. It says, by faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, catch this, even though he did not know where he was going. A lot of us have read that verse a lot of times and it's become white noise and honestly that's a shame because that is remarkable faith that is built on a foundation of uncertainty. Just to put it in modern terminology, let's think about this. Imagine you go to LA. It's a big city, it's got complicated freeways, it's one of the most notoriously difficult cities to drive in and you're in the car with your friend, you're at the hotel and you're going to the Griffith Observatory. And so you pull out of your parking spot, you pull out of the parking lot and you hit the road and your friend says, okay, where are we going? And you're like, I don't know, but we're going, we're driving, we're getting on the freeway, this is happening. This is how crazy it was that Abraham did this. He packed up his entire family, all of his possessions, he jumped on his camel and he just started walking. He had no idea where he was going, but you know what he did know? He did know that his God would guide every step, that he would provide direction and clarity and certainty along the journey. And we can learn from his example, certain uncertainty. Continuing on in verse 9, it says, By faith he, Abraham, made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, this is Abraham's wife. Even Sarah, who was past childbearing age. And let me just say, that is a euphemism if I've never heard one. Past child and bearing age, this woman wasn't 50 years old or something like that. She was actually 90 years old. She was past childbearing age. It was over. She was closed for business. <laughs> she was past childbearing age, but she was enabled to bear children. Why? Because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he is good as dead, that is actually very hurtful. <laughs> can't believe that's in the Bible, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. Skipping down to verse 17, by faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. This is key. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. You know, we know scripture, we've heard all the stories, so we know about Lazarus raising from the dead, we know about Jesus raising from the dead, we know that Jesus was able to raise a young girl from the dead. This is something that in our context, having the privilege of knowing the entirety of scripture, we know that resurrection is possible through Jesus and through the power of the Holy Spirit, but Abraham, Abraham did not have that same context. You see, up until this point in history, resurrections had never even taken place. So this was the level of certain uncertainty that this man possessed. He said, God is asking me to sacrifice the fulfillment of his promise in my life. This son that my wife Sarah conceived at 90 years old, that was born and was promised to me that this would be my legacy through his life. God's asking me to sacrifice him. But you know what he did? He obeyed God. He did exactly what God told him to because he reads and you know what? I don't understand all the details, but I bet that God is so big and so powerful that he could even raise my son from the dead. And I think there's a lesson we can learn from these stories. This is a double negative. So if you're an English major, you're going to hate me right now. 
don't dwell on what you don't know. That's going to drive you crazy. But do dwell on what you do know, because that's liberating. What do I mean by that? Don't dwell on the things you can't control, the things that are outside your understanding, outside your comprehension, because that's going to drive you crazy. But can I tell you, you can dwell on what you do know and what you do know about God and his character and his nature and his word. Don't dwell on what you don't know, but dwell. Choose to put your focus on what you do know. This is exactly what Abraham and Sarah did. Sarah had no idea how her body could physically bear a child. It was physically impossible for that to happen, but she chose not to dwell on that reality. Instead, it says she considered him faithful who had made the promise. She dwelled on what she knew about God's nature and God's character and allowed that to influence the way she perceived her situation. Abraham had no idea why God was asking him to sacrifice the fulfillment of his promise. He could not reconcile. It didn't make sense in human understanding. But he chose not to dwell on that. Instead, he chose to focus on the reality that God had the power to raise his son from the dead. And he chose to trust God completely. Can I tell you, it can be the same in your life. It's like, I don't know why this horrible thing happened. I don't know why you lost that person. But I do know that God is still good and that he has the power to work all things together for the good of those who love him. I don't know why that person hurt you and betrayed you deeply and you still wear the scars of that today. But I do know that there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother and I do know that God is faithful even when we are faithless. I don't know why your life isn't working out the way you always hoped and dreamed and imagined it would. But I do know that God has a plan for your life. He has plans to prosper you. He has plans to give you a hope and a future. Can I tell you, don't dwell on what you don't know, but dwell on what you do know. The greatest weapon you can wield against uncertainty is the weapon of the word of God. The truth of scripture, the truth of God's character and nature. It can be found within these pages. And you may not find certainty in these pages. I'm not telling you tonight you can open up to page 1022 and find what major you should be pursuing this year. You may not find certainty, but you can absolutely find clarity. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, he will make everything clear. He will illuminate your path, and he will give you direction for every step. I do believe beyond the shadow of a doubt that clarity can be found on well-worn pages. We love the word of God. So first, we need to embrace uncertainty. And secondly, tonight, we need to embrace our own futility. We need to embrace the fact that we are weak and we are limited. And you might be thinking to yourself, wow, Delaney, that's a buzzkill. That's kind of a depressing point. And it can be unless you choose to view it in a way that I think we can as we get to the end of this. I believe that there's power in embracing your futility, embracing the fact that you as a human being are simply limited in your understanding. Can I tell you that there are things that you will simply never know and you will never understand? It doesn't matter how many college degrees you get. It doesn't matter how many languages you learn. It doesn't matter how many countries you travel to. It doesn't matter how many books you read. And it does not matter how many podcasts you listen to. There are some things that you will never know and there are some things that you will never understand. So in the mystery, you are faced with your own weakness. We find out that we don't know it all. And not only that, you can't know it all. And in the mystery, you encounter your own humanity. And isn't it interesting that as a culture and as a society, we have made that into a bad thing. Embracing our weakness, Embracing our limitations as humans, we've made that into a bad thing. But can I tell you tonight that in the weakness, you're actually primed for wonder? It's exactly the place you want to find yourself when it comes to this journey of faith. I love what Psalm 8, 3 through 4 says. It says, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them. I love this because the psalmist is saying here, 
what is mankind in light of all of the glory and majesty of our God? I think when you are aware of your weakness, you are more perfectly positioned for wonder. Wonder at God's majesty and goodness, just the fact of how big he is, how beyond our understanding and comprehension. You know, there's something about space that just makes you feel small. Brandon talked last week, we, we have this weird thing for space. We love just learning about it. We love exploring more about it. And, and the more that you learn about it, the more you realize how big it is, how, how expansive it is. And it can be intimidating because you realize how finite you are, how limited you are. And I think that's exactly what David is writing in this psalm when he says, when I consider your heavens, when I consider the moon and the stars, the only conclusion I can come to is what is man that you, creator God, creator of all of this, would be mindful of us. I think just like a child who marvels at the strength and the wisdom of their parents, there is beauty found in the posture of one who has embraced their own futility and stands in awe of God. If we get to a place where we know everything, where we understand everything, where we can comprehend every idea and every thought, then we no longer have the capacity for wonder. Why? Because we figured it all out. There's nothing left for us to marvel at. There's nothing left to leave us in a state of awe. And I think that an integral part of faith is wonder. Understanding you can't understand it all and marveling at the God who does. You know how small, when you know how small you are, you can know how big your God is. And I think if you've lost your wonder at God, at his majesty, at his enormity, at his creativity, at his power, at his omnipotence, you're going to find yourself with a faith that is dry, dull, and honestly dead. You know, there's a um, child educational psychologist named Catherine Lecouye. I looked up how to say her name because it's a fancy French name. And I wanted to pronounce it right. But she wrote a book called The Wonder Approach. And this book examines, the thesis of this book is that education in children is contingent upon a sense of wonder. And as I was reading this thesis, I was struck by the parallels that I saw between the idea of wonder and its attachment to our faith. I want to read to you part of her thesis. She says, we suggest... Wonder at the center of all motivation and action in the child. Wonder is what makes life genuinely personal. Beauty is what triggers wonder. Kind of like we just read in that psalm. Just seeing the beauty of God's creation, it triggered a sense of wonder in the psalmist. Wonder attunes to beauty through sensitivity and is unfolded by secure attachment. When wonder, beauty, sensitivity, and secure attachment are present, learning is meaningful. On the contrary... When there is no volitional dimension involved, in other words, no wonder, when there is no end or meaning, in other words, no beauty, and no trusting predisposition or secure attachment, the rigid and limiting mechanical process of so-called learning through mere repetition become a deadening and alienating routine. And isn't that what faith without wonder looks like? Mere repetition, a deadening and alienating routine. May we never lose our wonder. My prayer for this trip around the sun that we're embarking on together is that we never lose our wonder. May we always remain in awe of our God. May we be humbled by his greatness and may that lead us to a place of trust, not in ourselves, but in him. The last thing I'll say on this point is there's a song by Bethel Worship and it's called Wonder and this is what the lyrics say, I love it. It says, may we never lose our wonder. Wide-eyed and mystified, may we be just like a child, staring at the beauty of our king. So if we're going to embrace the mystery, we have to embrace uncertainty. We have to embrace our own futility. And lastly tonight, we have to embrace God's sovereignty. I think we've established that we need to embrace uncertainty as a friend, welcome it into our lives. It's a foundational pillar of our faith. I think we understand now that a an understanding of our human futility leads us to an enlarged sense of wonder. And now the last piece, which I consider to be the most important piece, what our view of God is. Things are unknown. We're not big enough or wise enough or smart enough to know them all. But guess what? We serve a God who does and a God who can. I love this quote by Alicia Britt Cholley. She says, to dance when we do not know the steps 
requires us to value our partner over our performance. Our partner in the stance of life. God is, is the ultimate, sovereign, omnipotent, all-knowing one. And he's leading us in the stance of life, guiding us, giving direction, and, and coming upon us not to worry about our performance, but rather lean into our partner, lean into his leadings. Embracing the mystery causes us to get a glimpse of how great God truly is, because only God knows the beginning from the end, right? Only God knows the reason for the way things happen. Only God has all of the answers to all of the questions in the universe. Only God. And when we begin to understand that and have a revelation of that reality, it causes us to shift in the way that we see God. It causes us to have a little bit more reverence for the reality of his magnitude in our lives. I love what Job 11.7 says. It says, can you fathom the mysteries of God? Can you probe the limits of the Almighty? Those are rhetorical questions because the answer is no. We will never fully comprehend God. I think for so many of us, we kind of prefer a God in a box, one that we can understand, one that we can wrap our mind around, one that we can fully comprehend. But I don't know about you, I don't want a God that can be in a box. I want a God that is so wild and so big and so strong and so great that sometimes it goes beyond my comprehension and beyond my understanding. God is unsearchable. One commentary said this, the ages of his eternity cannot be numbered, nor the spaces of his immensity measured. The depths of his wisdom cannot be fathomed, nor the extent of his power bounded. The brightness of his glory can never be described, nor the treasures of his goodness counted. Isaiah reiterates this in his prophetic narrative. In Isaiah 55, this is God speaking. He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So why does it matter how we view God? Why does it matter our, our understanding and perception of who he is, his sovereignty? You know, when I was a little girl, I remember really dealing with night terrors. I was so afraid that someone was gonna break into our house and I had really weird night terrors about mountain lions jumping through my window and killing me and eating me, who knows. But I, I couldn't sleep a lot of the time and so what I would do is when I was scared, I would get out of bed and I would run to my parents' room and I would climb into bed next to my dad. Because just being next to him, just feeling his presence, knowing how much he loved me and how he would do anything for me, I felt a sense of protection, safety, and security wash over me. And I think the same is true when it comes to our Heavenly Father. The closer you get to his strength, the more you begin to understand his bigness, the more you can get a revelation of just how much he loves you. I believe it gives you a sense of safety and security that will cause you to view uncertainty and even your own futility in a completely different light. No longer is it an intimidating thing, no longer is it a discouraging thing, but rather you can sit in the middle of your uncertainty and you can say, you know what, having this big view of God isn't causing me to resist uncertainty, no, it's causing me to rest in my uncertainty because my God's got this. I don't have to worry. I don't have to strive. I don't have to manipulate or control. I don't have to make things work out the way that I think that they should. My God is in control and I can rest in that reality. We need to have an understanding of God's sovereignty. And you know, can I say it's, it's not a bad thing to not have all the answers when it comes to God. I think that's a lie that a lot of us believe. Maybe you're early on in your faith and you're hesitant to share it with people because I don't know enough of the Bible. I don't know enough about God. I think there are way too many preachers and teachers who love to stand on a stage with a microphone and pretend like they have every single answer to every single one of your questions about the mysteries of God. But I think there's a lot of pride and arrogance in that type of mentality. I think there's actually something beautiful about a humility of heart that says, God, you are so far beyond my comprehension 
Your grace and your love are so much greater than I can understand. Your ways are higher than mine. And because of that, I fully submit my life to your sovereignty. And that is what embracing the mystery looks like in its fullness. Submission to the only one who has a full revelation of all of time, eternity, and the deepest questions of the universe. Understanding that he is in control. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I want to be the kind of person that in the face of uncertainty, in the face of things I don't know, in the face of questions that can't be answered, I don't allow them to cause me to step back from my faith. I don't want to make the mysteries of God that I can't understand to be null and void just because I can't get my mind around them. I want to have the kind of faith that says, you know what, I'm going to build upon this uncertainty. I'm not going to dwell on what I don't know. I'm going to lean into what I do know. I want to live in that state of mystery, continuously in shock, continuously in awe, continuously in wonder of my God, and seeing the miraculous ways he continuously shows up in my life. That's what living in this state of mystery looks like, and it's a beautiful thing. Lastly tonight, I want to read you a scripture from Isaiah 40, and if you're dealing with issues of not really comprehending the sovereignty of God, I'd encourage you every morning, read Isaiah 40. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you tonight, but just a few of the verses. This is God speaking in verse 25. Can you find anyone or anything to compare to me? Where is the one equal to me? Lift up your eyes to the sky and see for yourself. Who do you think created the cosmos? He lit every shining star and formed every glowing galaxy. He stationed them all where they belong. He has numbered counted and given everyone a name. They shine because of God's incredible power and awesome might. Not one fails to appear. Why then, O oh Jacob's tribes, would you ever complain? And my chosen Israel, why would you say, Yahweh isn't paying attention to my situation. He has lost all interest in what happens to me. Don't you know? Haven't you been listening? Yahweh is the one and only everlasting God the creator of all you can see and imagine. He never gets weary or worn out. His intelligence is unlimited. He is never puzzled about what to do. He empowers the feeble and infuses the powerless with increasing strength. Even young people may faint and get exhausted. Athletic ones may stumble and fall, but those who wait for Yahweh's grace will experience divine strength. They will rise up on soaring wings like eagles, run their race without growing weary, and walk through life without giving up. This is the God that we serve, the maker of the heavens and the earth, the giver of strength and energy and direction and passion in your life. And the sooner we can begin to embrace the fullness of his mystery, embrace uncertainty, embrace our futility, and embrace, most importantly, the sovereignty of our God, the sooner we're set up for a path of a fruitful life and purpose on this earth. If the worship team wants to come out and join me. In closing tonight, I think that one of the greatest mysteries of God, one that has captivated the hearts of mankind since the very beginning is the mystery and the reality of why God would come back for us. If you know our story of humanity, you know that in the very beginning, God and mankind experienced perfect harmony together. But when sin came onto the scene, it fractured that relationship. God is perfect and holy and sinless. He can't be around sin. And so distance was created between God and humanity. And this broke the heart of God. And for centuries, this is how we live, separated from God, doing our best to get to him, do, giving our best efforts to try to be worthy of his love. Until one day, God in all of his divinity and majesty and power in heaven, he chose to send his son Jesus down to earth not just to patch things up, try to fix it. No, he sent him to die a horrible death for us. So that gap might be bridged forever. And when you consider the magnitude of that decision, that our holy God would send his perfect son to die so that you might have relationship with him, so that I might have relationship with him, despite the fact that he did this while we were still sinners, 
while we were continuously choosing ourselves, while we were continuously making decisions that grieved the heart of God, he still chose to send his son Jesus. This is a mystery that has captivated the hearts and the imaginations of humanity for generations. This is the mystery of salvation, the mystery of grace. In closing, we're about to sing that song, As You Find Me Again. And oh, that song wrecks me, literally. We actually, that's one of the lyrics, but it does. And the song is really singing about this mystery of God. It says, I know I don't deserve this kind of love. Somehow this love is who you are. It's a grace I could never add up. To be somebody you still want, somehow. You love me as you find me. Despite your failures, despite what's going on in your heart, despite those things that you know you need to leave behind you but you can't seem to get out of your life, despite what's been done to you, despite even what you will do in the future, he loves you as he finds you. Nothing will change that reality. If everyone could bow their heads and close their eyes tonight, I wanna extend a response to you. Maybe you came in here tonight and hearing this message and understanding the fullness of who our God is and how much he loves you and the length that he was willing to go to get into relationship with you. Can I tell you tonight, you might be feeling something within yourself. I wanna tell you that's not emotion, that's not just a moment that's being cultivated, but that's actually the presence of the Holy Spirit stirring something up in your heart, beckoning you to come home. Do you know how much he loves you? Do you know that he would search the ends of the earth to have an opportunity for this moment, to reach his hands out, lovingly extending them to you, saying, child, come home. This is your opportunity to accept this divine ministry, mystery, the mystery of grace, the mystery of the gospel. And if that's you in this place, I wanna pray with you in a minute but before I do so I know who I'm praying for, would you lift a hand in here tonight so we know who we're praying for? You wanna accept the mystery of salvation, the mystery of grace. Thank you. To those of you who raised your hands, this is a significant day. Your life will never be the same. Things change from here on and let me tell you, it only gets better from here. God is for you and he is with you. We're about to pray a prayer together and I'm gonna say some words and I'd like for you, if you raised your hand, to repeat them after me. But I don't wanna make anyone feel uncomfortable or awkward and so I'm gonna ask all of our YA fam, let's all repeat these words together so that we can cultivate an atmosphere of celebration and an atmosphere of faith as our new brothers and sisters make the decision to come home and respond to Jesus. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for sending your son on my behalf. God, it doesn't make sense. I know I'm a sinner, but I'm grateful for how much you love me. I turn from my old life and I step into a new future with you. I love you, Jesus, and it's in your name we pray.